Welcome to time-saving research tips for the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. We're so glad that you could join us today and hope that you'll introduce yourselves by name and major or department in the chat feature. My name is Brittany Squire and I'm Outreach Services Specialist for Forsyth Library and I'm happy to be your host for today. Today's session will be recorded and made available on Forsyth Library's YouTube channel at a later date. We do ask that you remain on mute during the session, but please feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions or make comments, and we'll address those just as soon as we can. I also wanna remind you that by being with us today, you have been entered into a prize drawing, so please stick with us until the end of the session where we will announce that drawing winner. Now I would like to introduce our guest presenters today. Kelly Havinga, who is the library liaison for communication studies, criminal justice, leadership studies, political science, and sociology. And also Brian Gribben, who is the liaison for English, history, modern languages, and philosophy. These experts will be going over some valuable research tips with you today. In today's session, we will be discussing primary and secondary sources, how to search for sources, and where to search for resources, covering both databases Sage Statistics and High and Online. We will wrap up the session by telling you where to go for help and how you can get some additional information on utilizing all of these great library resources. Without further ado, I would like to turn the program over to Brian Gribben. It's also going to be important to pay attention to the limitations of old scholarship. And let me provide you with an example. Um, through decades, scholars have, have had limited access to the Vatican records of Pius XII. And that's lead, left a lot of questions unanswered, particularly about the papacy's position toward toward the mass murder of European Jews, right, the Holocaust. Um, and, more, and, and also, what efforts or failures did, did the Vatican undertake, or, you know, did undertake to, to prevent it, to mitigate it? Well, we know now that information has been released, um, or excuse me, what information that had been released represented only, only a small portion of the available documentary record. And it left a lot of questions unanswered and resulted in a lot of speculation, okay? However, in 2019, the Vatican unsealed Pius XII's archives. So we can expect that new, a whole new generation of Holocaust scholarship is going to be produced that has been working with a wider more complete record. So that's obviously going to change or modify a lot of past interpretations. Okay, so that's one thing to consider. So secondary resources are going to play a key role in your research by introducing you to your topic and by providing a, a, a historical or broader context. I want to caution you though. How, what appears to be, at first glance, obviously a secondary source, well, there's more than meets the eye here. It can be used in other ways. Now, I want to emphasize this last point, as, as sometimes but the distinction between primary and secondary sources can be a little ambiguous. This depends not on the research, the resource type itself, you know, whether it's a monograph, whether it's a journal article, whether it's a newspaper article, okay? But it depends largely on the context in which it's being used and when the resource is created. Now, sometimes the same source can be a, both a primary source and a secondary source, depending on how you approach it. I want you to consider, for example, the Robert Graves novel, I, Claudius. Now, if I'm writing a seminar paper on, on the Roman Emperor Claudius, is, is the novel going to be a primary source? Feel free to chime in on, on chat, but I can already tell you, of course it isn't, right? <laughs> um, the novel's written almost 1900 years after Claudius's reign, 
and it's a fictionalized account of, of historical events, right? But if my topic, or the topic of my research, isn't the actual historical Claudius, but rather the works of Robert Graves, or if, you, if you're using the BBC adaptation, the films of Herbert Weiss, then the book or the movie will be considered a primary source. Now, as implied above, when a resource was created also determines whether or not it's going to constitute a primary or secondary source. A quick example, let's say, hypothetically, a newspaper article in last week's New York Times was about remembering the Lincoln assassination, okay? Obviously not a primary source. However, if we look at New York Times coverage from April 1865 about the Lincoln assassination, obviously that's a primary source. Now, there's going to be a wealth of open access and subscription databases available through Forsyth Library um, in which you can locate case studies, statistics, government resources, and in, in both the general and special collections, literary titles, interviews, oral histories, historical documents, or, or even reproduced compilations of historical documents, photographs, and other materials that can be used as, as, as physical sources, excuse me, primary sources. And it's not exhaustive. Um, we don't have everything, that's just impossible. But myself, Kelly, and our other librarians can help guide you to what we do have as well as authoritative collections and archives outside Forsyth Library that are going to contain primary source materials relevant to your research topic. And I'm going to hand things over to Kelly now, and she's going to visit with you about how to search these collections once you've found them. Thanks, Brian. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. So I'm going to show you how to do some searching on the Forsyth Library that's going to be helpful for you. Um, so as Brian was saying, there are different types of resources that are out there and primary resources are very focused. You have to look for them in specific places. We're going to talk a little bit about that later, but right now what I want to focus on is how to look for those secondary sources. Because when you're actually going through the research process, what you end up doing is you start off with your secondary sources, your background information. Then from there you start figuring out what you need for your primary sources and then oftentimes you circle back around and look at secondary sources again. And that's part of the research process. So when you're on the library homepage, this is where you want to look for your secondary resources. Uh, my advice for you is when you are searching, I'm going to expand the size of the screen a little bit. When you are searching, you want to hit the advanced search link above the search everything bar. Um, this is the first advice I give to students usually. And this is because when you are searching, you want to search multiple keywords. Give me a thumbs up if you've heard the term keywords before. All right. So basically what the keywords are is they encapsulate the concept of what you're trying to search. So I saw that uh, one of you was in criminal justice. So let's say you are interested in pre prison rehabilitation programs. What you would do is you would type in prison and rehabilitation. And generally speaking, when you're searching for those secondary resources, you want at least two sets of keywords. Uh, and the reason why that is, is that you're trying to focus on the resources you really actually want as opposed to thousands or millions of resources that may or may not be helpful to you. And the rule of thumb is, is most of the time we don't make it to the 12th page of results. So when you're searching, you really only want about 42 solid returns. So I'm going to search using these terms. And I'm sure a couple of you are familiar with this, but I would highly suggest using filters on the right side of the screen. Um, for many of you, you are maybe online and or you are searching from home. So you're going to want full text online. And you're probably going to want peer reviewed and you're probably going to want articles. Now, before I keep talking, I want you to notice something. The first returns that I have right now are books. 
And that isn't necessarily a bad thing. If you are at that stage where you're doing your background research, I suggest you look at those books. I suggest that you look at their chapters and their introductions. You look at their bibliographies, as Brian mentioned for bibliographic mining. Go through and see what you don't know or what you need to know before you start looking for specific primary resources. And books are great for that because they have a large breadth of information uh, without too much depth. And then, although I've pointed out the peer review and the full text online, once you start getting your primary resource documentation, that's when I suggest looking for specific scholarly articles, because those are in-depth topics. They're focused. Um, they, they dig in deep. And there are also opportunities for mining those bibliographies as well. Uh, do I have any questions about this before I continue? I know many of you are pretty familiar with this, so I don't want to uh, belabor it. Let's see. If so, feel free to put something in the chat. Okay. Um, one other thing that I want to point out to you, and my face is probably covering it, but in the upper right corner of the search screen, there's a button that says sign in. If it doesn't show your name, I suggest that you sign in. And the reason is, is if you are searching remotely and you can't access an article online, this is probably most likely the cause because you're not signed in yet. Um, so if you're having this issues uh, accessing a full text online, double check to make sure you're signed in. All right. We are on a limited time frame, so I'd like to get us into the break breakout room. So Brian can show you how to find government documents, and so I can help you find statistics if you are interested. But uh, main recap there, I suggest that you use keywords when you're searching. Uh, don't type in an entire sentence like you might with Google. Uh, use and or or, so using those multiple keywords uh, and then use quotes. We didn't have to in this example because I showed you single keyword phrases, but if you were looking for something like the electoral college, I would suggest putting electoral college in quotation marks. And then also filters are your friend. Uh, you don't want thousands of results. You only want about 42 and filters help you get there. All right, excellent. Then let's break out into our search rooms. Uh, Brittany, I'm going to turn it over to you for a moment. Yes, thank you, Kelly. I have pre-assigned the break rooms, and so you will receive an invitation here in just a moment to join those. Um, just a note that each breakout session will last uh, approximately 10 minutes, and then you will be invited back to the main room for a quick wrap-up session. Once you're in the room, you, you won't be able to switch, but I think that we've got you in the desired location. So at this time, I would invite you to um, join the breakout room indicated on your screen. All right, so I'm going to talk to you for the next 10 minutes about how to find statistics using the library database Sage Stats. So the first step is to actually get there. If you go to the research um, databases, under which is a tab under the search bar on the home page it'll take you to this page which is all of the library's databases uh, the fastest way to sort through this is to just click the s button and sage stats will be the second one down so what sage stats is is a collection of different data sets from various go government organizations um, and i'm going to show you how to find specific types of data sets using this tool However, uh, here's something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Statistics are created by someone counting something somehow, and it varies. Uh, some instances or phenomena are more difficult than, to count than others, while uh, other phenomena can be used as approximizations of what you're trying to research, uh, so on and so forth. And creating these data, data sets that statistics are derived from takes time. So what you're looking for, there might not be immediate statistics for, uh, but that's okay. Now, the first thing about searching in Sage Stats 
is that it's a little bit different than what you're normally used to when you're searching a library database. So we often, uh, or librarians when I say we, often tell students to be as specific as possible when they're searching. So use multiple sets of keywords, so on and so forth. But in the case of Sage Stats, you actually want to be a little bit vague or know the exact name of the data set you are looking for. And here's why. Uh, when you have a normal database, what it does is it searches the entire text of an article for your keywords. Uh, so you can use approximate terms, a little bit of vagueness, so on and so forth, and there's a decent chance it's going to be trapped somewhere in the text of the article you're looking at or looking for. That's just not the case with a data set, because most of what is in a data set content-wise is numbers. There's actually very little text for uh, the database to look through to find your terms. So browsing using the topics on the right side, right over here, is actually a very legitimate strategy for finding data sets. However, uh, let's start with something basic. Let's do income. I will say Sage Stats usually takes a little bit longer to load than other databases. So right now we've got over 367 results. There's a decent chance that this probably isn't what you're looking for. So let's say we want to focus on like the place type for your research. So instead of city, county, metro area, state, zip code, all right, let's focus on county. Let's look at the personal income or the income based off county. So it starts out with total social security recipients. But if we scroll down, we have median household income. This data set would be, interest, uh, would be helpful for someone who is looking to start a business in an area or someone who is interested in taxes for a specific region. So if I click this, what's really cool is that, the, is that how Sage Stat works is that it provides me a map of all the counties in the US who have, af who have offered data to the data set and gives you this legend over on the right. And it gives you ranges for the amount of money per household. And when I say per household, I'm talking median income, so an average. Uh, there are three different ways to determine the average of something, and luckily Sage Stats tends to des designate whether it is a median or a mode, so on and so forth. So we're looking at the median household income. I can then curse over the map itself to see if I can find a particular county. And I also have these plus and minuses buttons so I can uh, pull in close to look at specific counties. Like, let's see if I can find Ellis. This is a sign that I haven't lived in Kansas long enough. Graham, Sheridan, Thomas. Okay, well, there's Grove City. Um, but this is a really good way of comparing different areas uh, in the state or different areas in the country to others. Also along the top is this number bar, which will give you the dates for the different data sets. Notice how the most recent date for this data set is 2018. And that's actually pretty recent for data. And that's because uh, median household income is something that is regularly recorded in our tax code. If you're looking for something a little bit more out there, uh, it might not be as recent or as clear or focused types of data. For example, a lot of uh, police departments don't necessarily report specific types of crime to a national database. It's been a huge work in the criminal justice system to try and actually record national data sets of crime statistics. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. The other thing that I want to point out to you is this tab right over here that says source. Always, always, always click the source tab. And the reason why is because there are different types of organizations that create data sets, and some of them are simply better than others. Uh, for example, this one comes from the US Census Bureau, which is actually uh, pretty decent as far as data sets go. There are a lot of issues that come with conducting the census, uh, but this is probably relatively decent. 
and you know it's relatively, um, you know that there are people backing this information and that there is quality control and quality check checks that go into the creation of this data set. Um, other kinds of entities that create statistics might be an advocacy group, which will often misreport information to make a point, or it could be just a random website. The most common thing in the world is to misrepresent statistics. We repeat numbers and numbers over and over again without context or meaning, and they transform like a giant game of telephone. So if you can go back to the original source, which in this case is the Census Bureau, you know that it's actually good data, as opposed to this number that's been reported over and over again. Uh, my favorite example of this is that a, this was in a graduate thesis, and a student opens up with this really strong quote of, uh, since the year 1972, the number of children gunned down in the United States has doubled every year. That statistic is absolutely bogus. Because if it was in 1972, and this particular thesis was from the 80s, that means that every single year since 1972, the number of children dying in gun-related accidents has doubled. At some point, that is an exponential growth. So at some point, it actually, I think in the 90s, if that number had been true, the number of children killed in gun-related accidents would have exceeded the world's population. And no one blinked an eye at that. And that's because people aren't very good with numbers. And a way to avoid doing something like that is to make sure that you go to the original data set. So, very convoluted way of saying, always check the source of where the data is coming from. Um, additionally, something that you might want to consider is whether the number reported is likely to be accurate. So I mentioned that the census has some problems, but there are other types of data or phenomena that are inherently difficult to count. So for example, if you have someone who is trying to research how much time we spend on social media, that might be pretty hard if you're asking for a survey. So if, uh, and the reason why is because when people are self-reporting information about themselves, you tend to get a biased perspective from that person. No one wants to admit that they just spent eight hours on Facebook looking at their ex's like profile. No one's going to admit to that. So there are different ways to count that type of information that would be more helpful, such as looking at browser history. Uh, so keep in mind when you're looking at a specific phenomena, how likely the number is to be accurate and how they did the counting in the first place. And that's a really good way to determine whether your statistics are good. Now, Sage Stats, although it has a lot of different data states, data sets might not have everything that you need. So if you can't find what you're looking for, my first bit of advice is to go to a government organization that is likely to have that information. For example, if you want crime statistics, go to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. If you're looking for statistics on median income, sometimes the Tax Bureau is the place you want to go. Uh, these are all different ways to find what you are looking for. And if you can't find it, please come and talk to a librarian. Uh, and the reason is, is that there's a decent chance we'll be able to hunt it down for you. And sometimes statistics are also buried in scholarly articles. So keep an eye out for that as well, because all scholarly articles require original research. And a lot of that requires data creation. So, um, I hope this was informative, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Hello and welcome to the breakout session demonstrating the database collection Hine Online. Um, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to be showing you how to, how to use the resources available on this particular database to locate a wide variety of sources that would very well be relevant to 
specifically criminal justice, poli-sci, and pre-law majors, as well as history majors, depending on the individual topics that you're going to be looking for. Um, I'm going to talk primarily about how to do controlled keyword searches, look up um, fast case law uh, citations to, to locate the, in, the, the case in its entirety, and, and so on. So I'm going to go ahead and from the library's homepage, we're going to have a couple different approaches to, to locating this particular research database. Now, within these, these subject and course guides, particularly for criminal justice or history or so on, Hein Online will likely be included as a suggested database. But the quickest, most straightforward way to locate it is to click on the research database tabs, which take you into the A to Z list. Now you'll see um, these are all organized alphabetically. We can go into the pull down menu and look through specific um, discipline under the subject headings. But quickly, for the sake of expediency, we'll just go to H because we know the database that we want to look at and we'll go down to Hein Online. Now, what we like about this A to Z database is if you're uncertain about what type of, you know, database to use, what the contents are, by all means, note the description for each database. Kind of gives you an overview of what you're going to find. So we'll go ahead and click on Hein. If you're on campus, it'll take you right to it. If you're off campus, you'll likely need to log in with your TigerNet ID. So once here, we see that Hein Online itself is just a platform. It contains a multitude of databases. Now, let me jump back onto the library's main page. Um, in addition to searching that broad catalog that Kelly just showed you, we can jump in and look at individual databases that we subscribe to which includes Hein Online. So I'm going to go on the home page underneath the, search, the general search box in the research databases. Now there's a couple different approaches I can, I can use just to locate Hein Online, okay? One would simply be, since these are already alphabetized, I can just go to my H. But we also group these different databases underneath the different subjects they're relevant to. So for instance, I'm going to pick on you, Gina. I'm going to go to criminal justice under this drop down subject menu. And it's going to give me a listing and there's Kelly's smiling face. It's going to give me a list. Uh, this is surprising. I was almost positive Hein Online is included in criminal justice. So we'll need to make that change. So I can't pick on you, Gina. Um, <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but, I, but I'm going to go into history then. And even here, we're gonna find Hein Online listed. No, we're not. What the heck is going on here, Cindy? I'm on here. <laughs> no, um, so we won't do any of that, but we'll just do it alphabetically and go to Hein that way. So. We'll just see Hein Online listed. And on these database lists, they're going to give you a, descript, a broad description of the contents of each. Now, oh, for pity's sake. There we go. But everything was crashing on me. So within Hein Online, it's actually a platform. And it's going to contain a lot of various databases within it. And you can search the entirety of the databases at once doing things like a controlled subject or keyword search, um, as well as you can search within some of these individual collections. Now you'll note the databases themselves, if you hover over the little eye icon, it's going to tell, give you a description. So for instance, the Law Journal Library contains almost 2,800 law and law review related periodicals. You'll see things like the Pentagon Papers. It contains the entirety of the Pentagon Papers Daniel Ellsberg leaked to the New York Times. Um, different collections focused on a specific topic. We see um, things about slavery in America and the world. We see um, 
the Brennan Center for Justice Publications contains a lot about, uh, about the Second Amendment and, and gun rights and gun legislation, um, as well as more recent things about presidential impeachments and, and so on. Now we can do a broad, just textual search over the course of the entire database. So I have a few examples prepared, but I'm more interested in, in what, what you as students are, are interested in as well. Is there a particular topic related to your discipline that you might be interested in and you'll want to search? I'm going to chime in. Hi. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking of doing something with maybe Nixon uh -huh. surrounding Watergate. That's like coming up. So I'm kind of just, you know, fairly new. I've been gone for 16 years and I'm coming back to school. I was just, I, it's overwhelming. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's why we're here to make it a little less intimidating. So great topic. I'm glad you mentioned it because obviously, like I said, we just, we have that sub collection in Hein Online about presidential impeachment. But we can, we don't have to just focus on that specific database. So what we can do under the full text search, we can go and use an advanced search option similar to what Kelly had shown us earlier. And here we're going to go ahead and we'll have to change our fields. So I'm going to change everything to full text, which means the search terms we put in, it doesn't matter if they're found um, under the title, under the subject heading, it's just going to pull back in everything containing those, those specific um, specific terms. And since we're only going to probably be using single word search terms, so Nixon, if I, if my fingers allow me to type, Nixon and we'll just put Watergate. Now if I was to put a phrase um, like Watergate break in, I'm going to encase that in quotes because when I do that it tells these databases that I want that entire, that entire search phrase, that string, instead of giving me you know, 8,000 results with Watergate in it, 8,000 results with break-in, 16,000 with Watergate break-in, if that makes sense. And so we'll just go ahead and search you. And it's going to be a little slow, even though I'm on campus. And what we have, we have almost 22,000 returns, and we see all kinds of different materials, right? Bibliographies. Um, articles from law reviews, and so on. But what we can do then to filter out the results is, I'm gonna suspect, let's say hypothetically, you might just want primary source material, okay? So we can re refine it both by date, and we can put, let's say just 19, we can put in a custom date, 1972, well actually it'd be actually 1971, to 1974 when President Nixon resigned. And we can start off by applying this filter. And then we can also look at the collection we find these in. And I'll click on more and we can see 188 entries from the Presidential Impeachment Library, um, 60 based on from the executive privilege collection and so on. We can even go further and to select a specific subtopic. So let's, let's just assume we want to look in the impeachment library. That seems like the best place to start, okay? So I will go ahead and add that filter. So right now I'm just searching within this one specific collection from the dates 1971 to 1974. And as I review, I can do additional keyword searches and just search within these specific results. But as I review just the text we note that the highlights, the, the keywords we use are highlighted in the little summation of the text. And we have ways 
of downloading the entire document, either as a PDF or we can email it to ourselves. But also if we were to click on the title of the entry itself, it's going to give us synapses. It's going to give us the entire document. It's going to take a second to load here. But it's also kind of going to give us kind of a, a breadcrumb trail of where it's located. So yes, it's in the collection U.S. Presidential Impeachment Library, but the title is Statement of Information, Hearings Before the Committee on the Watergate Break-In. And if we wanted to cite this, we have options here. We have the citation tool that depending on the style that we're using for the discipline, and I believe you'd probably be using APA, you're going to see the citation and you can just copy it. United States is the creator, date of publication was 74, and the title of the document is the Statement of Information, Hearings Before the Committee, blah, 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 blah. Everything you'll need to know for the citation. Now, what's really useful here, um, not so much with this particular item, but uh, tell you what, let's jump back here. I see a chat here, let me see who's chatting. Great, I'm glad, glad you like it, Gina. Um, <laughs> let's go and let's look at the Supreme Court Library because I do want to show this feature here. And we'll see that you can search for cases. Oh, looks like we're going to run out of time here. Real quickly, you can search for cases um, and then you can see how often these particular cases are cited in other cases how many times they're mentioned in the American um, Law Library Institute, right? There's all kinds of useful tools that you can use to even do fast track cases. You can, uh, that's a quick option. If we do case law, you can do a fast case lookup. And let's see if I've, great, it's already saved mine. I can just put in a case citation See if it if we can beat the clock here. And it's going to bring you right to that case itself. Uh, last thing for my group. Uh, if you have any issues finding statistics and you're not finding them in Sage Stats, use Ask a Librarian. Because oftentimes there's a lot of digging that goes involved uh, that is involved in finding accurate statistics. So thank you. And since I got cut off, for those in my breakout session, ditto. If you run into issues manipulating the case, the fast case lookup, or you know, tracking precedent, contact us. Thank you so much, Brian and Kelly, for, for those last few minute tips. Um, and you, you let us into exactly what this wrap up session is for, is to give you a little bit more information on where you can go for additional help. So as both Brian and Kelly have mentioned, you are invited to always reach out directly to your library liaison. You've met Kelly and Brian today, but Jennifer Sauer is also a liaison for the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, and she works specifically with art and design and music and theater. You can also use the Ask a Librarian service in the following ways, by phone, email, by scheduling an appointment, or by using the live chat feature on the library's homepage. We're also excited to announce Forsyth Library's Research Help app. So if I could invite you all to take a moment, uh, pull out your mobile device and scan or take a photo of the QR code on the screen, and then you can follow the instructions to install the app on your phone. Through the Forsyth Library app, you will have access to the Ask a Librarian resources and services. You will also see subject and course guides, and you will see tutorials, which will help you navigate Forsyth Library resources and services as well. 
that now brings us to the end of the session. So we would certainly um, stay on here if there are some additional questions. It sounds like you might have gotten cut off. So I, I'm sure Brian and Kelly would be willing to answer questions. Um, otherwise, please feel free to utilize all the great resources on the library website and be sure to follow us on our social media platforms for more information about our services, programs, and other events like this. Thank you all so much and have a great day.